Today we are looking at a case from the mid part of the 19th century. So sit back as we go to Australia. Thomas John Augustus Griffin was born on the 27th of July 1832 in Sligo, a coastal town in northwest Ireland. At the time of his birth, the town was suffering from a severe outbreak of cholera. This was part of the second worldwide cholera pandemic that began in 1829 and ended in 1851. During the outbreak, the town recorded that 1,230 of its inhabitants had contracted the disease, of which 643 had died, although it is suspected that the death rate was much higher, as many people were reluctant to pay for a doctor. It was confirmed, however, that the population of the town dropped from 15,000 to 12,000. At just 17, Thomas already saw himself embarking on an adventure, and he joined the Irish Constabulary. Shortly after, he volunteered to serve in the British Army during the Crimean War. He initially worked as an assistant storekeeper in the commissariat department. He then obtained a commission as a cornet in the Turkish contingent. Thomas was awarded medals for his distinguished service in Crimea. After he returned home, he took advantage of an offer made to police volunteers who served during this time for free travel across the ocean to Australia. This led him to his new home in Melbourne, where he arrived in late 1856. Thomas had an exciting journey to Australia, during which he met a wealthy widow, who eventually became his wife. Unfortunately, their love story didn't last long. Thomas squandered her wealth, then cruelly sent her his own death notice to make it seem as though he had passed away. He then abandoned her and continued on his adventurous life. As he had gained experience in Ireland working with the Irish Constabulary and had fought in the Crimean War, he was offered a position in the New South Wales Police Force. This was in 1858, just before Queensland separated from New South Wales on the 6th of June 1859. Thomas was sent to the town of Rockhampton, where he was installed as acting sergeant. Eventually, he became the Chief Constable of Rockhampton. He was then transferred to Brisbane, where in 1862, he was given the position of acting clerk of Petty Sessions. And in 1863, this position became permanent. He had done well, but Thomas was a man of great ambition. He had become friendly with the sister of a prominent Queensland cabinet minister. And although they spent much time in each other's company, Thomas did not propose to her. Instead, he said that he'd need to be placed in a higher position in order for him to be able to provide for a wife. During the latter part of the 1850s, small gold deposits had been found across the Darling Downs and other parts of Queensland. This had resulted in the first Queensland gold rush, mainly in an area known as Canoona, some 50 miles from Rockhampton. Over the next few years, thousands of gold prospectors arrived there. Due to this, it was decided that a gold commissioner and police magistrate was needed, and Thomas was offered the position. Although he'd have to leave Brisbane, this was a great opportunity for him and one that he quickly accepted. As so many prospectors had arrived in this part of Queensland, the police were expected to perform additional duties, as well as making arrests and serving warrants. One of their main responsibilities was escorting gold and money. This of course came with many dangers, including robbery and attacks. So in order not to discourage the policemen, their pay was doubled when undertaking these hazardous journeys. Their involvement was needed, as prior to the police assisting with gold escorts, there have been reports of numerous attacks, some of which have resulted in murder. In November 1867, Rockhampton police officer Patrick William Cahill, who was 27 years old, and John Francis Power, who was 25, had been given the task of delivering £4,000 to a new bank in Claremont. This was needed to serve the community that had developed there following the gold rush. Patrick Cahill and John Power would have to travel there from Rockhampton on horseback. Rockhampton's gold commissioner was 35-year-old Thomas John Griffin and he offered to join the escort for part of the journey on the pretext that both officers were young and therefore quite inexperienced. It was, however, not really necessary for him to do so. A few days after they had set out, the men arrived at the Bedford Arms near the Mackenzie River crossing. The hotel was ran by Mr Alfred Harding Bedford. He needed to go to Rockhampton and it was agreed that Thomas would end his journey there and accompany Mr. Bedford back to Rockhampton. That night, Thomas and the two young policemen, Patrick William Cahill and John Francis Power, ate and drank at the hotel. They then returned to where they had set up camp. Although Thomas had said that he would keep an eye on the camp, 
Mr. Bedford told him that he could stay inside the hotel. The next day, Thomas and Mr. Alfred Harding Bedford started their journey back to Rockhampton, a distance of some 130 miles. When they arrived, they heard news that the two young policemen, Patrick Cahill and John Power, had been found dead at their campsites and the £4,000 they were taken to Claremont was missing. Thomas speculated that the victims must have fallen asleep and been killed as a result. After all, the task was dangerous and many had died before escorting money and gold. Thomas hastily arranged for a group of men to return and investigate. When they arrived, they initially thought that the death had been due to poisoning as there were two dead pigs found nearby. But after Dr. David Salmon had conducted an autopsy on the bodies, he reported that both men had actually been shot in the head and that no evidence of poison had been found, although he did think that they had probably been affected by some sort of narcotic and were both in a state of stupor when they were shot. The group were unable to transport the bodies to Rockhampton, so instead they removed the heads and stomach of Patrick Cahill and John Power and put them in big jars to take back for research purposes. They hoped that with proper examination, they'd be able to work out whether they were shot from a distance or from close range. Alfred Harding Bedford said that he had heard gunshots during the night that the two men were killed. He said that he woke up and realised that Thomas Griffin was not there. When Thomas eventually returned, Alfred Bedford said that he asked him about the gunshots, to which Thomas Griffin replied that he had gone to see the horses, but had lost his way, so fired, as he wanted to attract someone's attention. This information, however, only added to the growing suspicion that Thomas may have been involved in the double murder, and as a result, he was arrested. His arrest caused much discussion in Rockhampton, and many people refused to believe that Thomas John Augustus Griffin could have committed this most terrible crime. The newspapers also reported the arrests from very different viewpoints. The Northern Argos defended Thomas, while the Rockhampton Bulletin considered him to have been responsible for the murders. In the pursuit of justice, the Attorney General wrote to Dr. Salmon in an effort to determine whether Thomas was culpable for his crimes. With forensic science still developing, Dr. Salmon took matters into his own hands and started shooting sheep skulls as a way of replicating any potential damage done by the revolver. If it could be shown that the holes in the skulls were made by Thomas's revolver at close range, then there would be little doubt who the culprit was. Dr. Salmon then got himself some human skulls. They were old skulls that had been gathered by a skull collector. However, they lacked skin and flesh, causing arguments that the bullet holes would not be comparable. At this point, he enlisted the help of the Chief Medical Officer of Brisbane, Dr. William Hobbs. Dr. Hobbs oversaw the health of people in the state facilities, including jails, asylums and quarantine stations. He had professional access to recently deceased people who did not have any family or friends to complain about them being decapitated and then shot for Dr. Salmon's research. On January 2nd, 1868, Dr. Hobbs' attention was caught by the sudden arrival of a hundred South Sea Islanders on boats to Queensland. The Islanders were suffering from dysentery and were ordered by Dr. Hobbs to be taken to the Dunwich Quarantine Station on Stradbroke Island. Within two short weeks, 24 of the Islanders had passed away. Their heads were exactly what Dr. Salmon was after for his experiments. Most were buried near the station, from which Dr. Hobbs dug up their bodies and took their heads to be experimented on. The trial of Thomas Griffin began on the 16th of March 1868 and took place in Rockhampton. Thomas pleaded, not guilty. The trial had generated much public interest and huge crowds gathered outside the courts. The prosecution revealed that Thomas Griffin, who had been the Gold Commissioner and Police Magistrate, had been a man with a good reputation, but this soon started crumbling away when he amassed a large gambling debt of £230 with local Chinese miners, who threatened to expose him when he didn't pay them what he owed. Thomas had been trusted with their gold, however he failed to keep it safe and subsequently gambled it away. He could not bear the thought of the shame of being exposed as a thief and a gambler, so he did the only thing he could think of. He stole the money from the gold escorts. During the trial, Dr. Hobbs compared the bullet holes in the skulls of Patrick Cahill and John Power to the South Sea Islander skulls that had been experimented on. He was able to show that the bullets had been fired from the defendant's gun at close range. The trial ended on the 24th of March 1868 
and the jury found Thomas John Augustus Griffin guilty of murder. The judge then sentenced him to death. On the 1st of June 1868, Thomas was hanged at the Rockhampton jail. He was the first person to be executed in the town. Prior to his death, he maintained his innocence, denying his guilt to everyone he saw. As he was standing on the scaffold, the hangman asked him if he had anything to confess. Thomas replied firmly, No, I have nothing to confess. After his execution, his body was transported to the Rockhampton Cemetery, where he was buried in the Church of England section of the grounds. The hangman, Mr Joshua Hutton, collected souvenirs from the execution, including the clothes that Thomas was wearing and his beard, which was shaved off. When Thomas was buried, he was buried underneath the unknown sailor in hopes of discouraging grave robbers. However, several months later, when the grave was inspected, it was discovered that the sailor's body was intact while Thomas's head was gone. A reward of £20 for information regarding the disappearance of Thomas's head was offered by the government. However, it was never found and its current condition and location is unknown. It was believed that the local Rockhampton doctor, Mr. William Callaghan, took the head away and that the skull was in his doctor's surgery until his death in 1912. One theory claims that Thomas's head was taken in order to conduct research on what might cause someone to commit such horrific crimes. There have since been reports that the skull now sits on a shelf in an upper class private residence in Rockhampton, but these are just reports and the actual location of Thomas Griffin's skull remains a mystery. After the execution, it was said that Thomas confessed the truth of what he had done. The prison turnkey, Mr Alfred Grant, is said to have witnessed Thomas pacing up and down in his cell and desperately shouting out, It's no bloody good. I did it. Not one for giving up easily though. Thomas then attempted some clever bargaining with Mr Grant. He promised him a portion of the stolen money if he helped him escape. He provided him with a pencil sketch of where he hid it. However, despite two attempts, Mr Grant and the principal turnkey, Mr John Lee, could not find the hidden money. Upon failing to find it, they informed the sheriff, Mr Tom Scarrett Hall, who was now in charge of organising a search party to find the missing £4,000. During this, they found a half-burnt tree stump, which was covered by another tree stump that had been placed against it. When they removed the second stump, they found Thomas's bag, which contained the missing money. It was slightly damaged from the rain. Alfred Grant also revealed that Thomas had told him more about what had happened that day. He said that Thomas told him that he approached Patrick William Cahill and John Francis Power's camp, but John Power woke up and fired at him, and the bullet narrowly missed his head. It was so close that it passed through his beard. This caused Thomas to return fire out of self-defense. He shot John Power, and this woke up Patrick Cahill, who allegedly attempted to fire his pistol, but his pistol exploded, causing him to accidentally shoot himself. Mr Grant said that Thomas then told him that with both officers now dead, he had to make best of the situation, so stole the money. This version of how the officers died was met with great scepticism by the local press, the police and the people of Rockhampton. It was also believed that Thomas had written a letter confessing to the crimes. However, in 2008, it was discovered that this letter had been written by someone else and was actually dated two days after Thomas's execution. So although Thomas Griffin was found guilty, he went to his grave always protesting his innocence. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. As usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have, and I hope to see you all again in the next brief case.